And, uh, and that's what we're talking about. What we've been doing here is going through the Sermon on the Mount. Now, the Sermon on the Mount um, is not how to get to heaven. It's not about that. The Sermon on the Mount is what are, what are the characteristics of those who are going to be inhabiting heaven. And see, when we read this, the church has not been born. Okay? The first hint of the church is in Matthew 16. And that's just a hint. And when Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, he goes, Upon that, what? Confession of faith. I will build my church, right? He didn't even start then. When was the church born? The church was born on the day of Pentecost. And the rules changed. And see here, when Jesus is speaking to the religious people of the time, okay, what were they under in relationship to God? They're under the law, okay? They were under the law, those people that were talk, that Jesus is talking to. And so when we start, and let's first, we're, we're going to read the chapter. We're not going to read the whole chapter. We'll be here a long time. Um, we're going to read, we're finishing up the Sermon on the Mount. Now, we've been here, I counted 24 weeks in three chapters, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. So I said, so I was just counting there how many, uh, how long we've been here. I was counting each one. And I said, oh, 24. And Abby goes, oh, wow, that's a year. And I looked at her, I go, oh, wait a second, am I off here? <laughs> But it's close to a half a year we've been on the Sermon on the Mount. So it took Jesus about 12 to 15 minutes to speak these words. But it's taken us 24 hours of going through it. And, you know, we haven't even scratched the surface. So... But before we get going, I, would, I thought it would be a good idea to do a review of what have we covered. What have we covered? Okay? And as you think about this, I want you to think about, you know, what, what, is there, what does everybody say? How are you doing with that? Isn't that what everybody says when they say, I'm going to do something, and this is how I'm going to do it? How's it going in that? So as we read this, I want you to think that. In your mind, not as we read it, but as we review what we have covered. We covered the Beatitudes, being poor in spirit, being meek, being merciful, being pure in heart, being a peacemaker, finding reward through persecution, being the salt and the light. Your righteousness must exceed that of the Pharisees. And they were the creme de la creme. They were the, the top, right? So it has to exceed it. Anger in your heart. He talks about murder, but I say unto you, do you have anger in your heart? He talks about adultery, but I say, do you have lust in your heart? He says, keep your word instead of making oaths. Do, will you keep your word? If you say you're going to do something, are you going to do it? Okay. Are you going to go the second mile for others? Are you going to love your enemies? Oh. Are you going to do works not seen by men that only God sees. When you pray, do you pray with forgiveness in your heart? 
when you fast, which I had to admit at that time, I had never done a fast, but when you do fast, are you going to fast and do it for the right reasons? Are your treasures in heaven or is your treasure here? You have a single eye, or is it you have double vision? He says, Do not worry. Do you worry? Judge in the right manner. Have the wisdom of God of how to judge, but judge correctly. Don't be hypercritical, but don't just let everything go. Like, it doesn't matter what people do. I can go do what I want. The power of prayer. Knowing that you can only enter the kingdom of heaven through the narrow way. Now I'm going to ask the question again. How's that going for you? How's that going for you? Well, I, I'm here to share good news. It's not going good for me either. But you know what? I know the guy on the middle cross. He did it correctly. He did it right. He paid the Christ, the full freight. By grace you are saved. Through faith, not of yourselves. It is the gift. It's a free gift. Oh, it's free to us. But it cost him a lot. His one and only son. That, that one who is the most precious from all eternity, he said... Here. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You ever felt that way? Oh, Lord, I did it again. And that's why the message of grace, and I do call it free grace, it's unlimited grace. And if someone would love me that much, then my desire should be to live for the king who bought me. That should be my desire. My, my destination should determine my behavior now. I shouldn't go on doing the same things that I'm doing when someone's bought me with the price of his own dear son. But it's only grace. Why would God do that? Because he loves you. That's his motivation. He loves you. He loves his church. He loves the whole world. He laid it down for the world that whosoever will may come. I never see Jesus rejecting anyone, those that come to him by faith in his finished work. That's the good news of the gospel. That's the good news of the gospel. So we read now, he's, final, he's finalizing what we've been going through 24 weeks. And he says, okay, now I want to summarize this. I want to summarize this. So if you've got your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 7. Verse 24, and by the way, hasn't it been great going through the Sermon on the Mount? I have really learned a lot, and uh, 
you know, it's, you cannot exhaust the truth of Scripture. It's inexhaustible. But here we see Matthew 7, verse 24. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the what? The rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew, and beat on that house, and it did not fall. For it was founded on the but everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house. And it fell. And great was its fall. And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that these people, that the people, were astonished at his doctrine, at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. We thank God for the reading of his word, and all the saints said, Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your word, how it's living. Lord, how you're able to break down those strongholds. Lord, to teach us. Lord, you'd be well served to build your house on the rock. So, Lord, we pray. Lord, if we've never placed our faith in you, Lord, that we would do it right now, right here. We transfer our trust from myself to you, that we would trust in, rely on for the rest of our lives. Lord, thank you. Your work is enough for us. So, Lord, we just pray for this time that you be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. So I call this Houses, Storms, and foundations, okay? And there's two of each, right? And so as we get started, I would ask yourself some questions that we want answered here. Today, do you want to be wise or do you want to be foolish? Okay? Are you wise or do you want to be foolish? You know, Proverbs, the first eight chapters deals with that question. Wise man, foolish man. And it's something that really in most societies, they do think about. Okay? If, they're, if they're not uh, living according to the flesh, we sh God has put an itch in our heart. Man was made for eternity. Something went wrong. The fall. And so as we live our lives, hopefully we're thinking, am I living a wise life? Now that's wisdom that comes from God. Or am I like a fool? And like I said, we, we could go through a number. We'll, we'll turn to one. Uh, specifically the first eight chapters. That's what it deals with. And who was Solomon? He was, besides Jesus Christ, the wisest man who ever lived, right? Because he asked God for it, and God gave it to him. But we're listening to someone here who's more wise than Solomon. Okay? He's the one that bestowed wisdom. So, are we wise or foolish? Look at uh, Proverbs chapter 26, 
Real quickly, verse 12, is read a couple, even though it's not the first eight chapters, but you see it throughout. Do you see a wise, 26, 12, do you see a wise, do you see a man wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than him. <laughs> okay, look at another one real quickly. Proverbs 12, verse 15. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes. But he who heeds counsel is wise. Okay? And boy, do we need counsel, right? Even as born-again believers, right? Yes, he's given us now, the, whole, the church has been born, he's given us the Holy Spirit. But we need counsel, right? God says there's wisdom in the multitude of counsel. So, but in this passage here, in Matthew chapter 7, there's no description of the person. Okay? It's just wise men or foolish. And I think we need to ask ourselves, because, you know, let's face it, we, we, does life get busy for you? Most people, especially here, life gets busy. Right? And a lot of times we don't think about... The next day. Sometimes we don't think the next year, 10 years. And I want you to think about what am I, if I'm a wise man, what am I building on? Look ahead 20, 30, 40 years. I think this is spiritually accurate. Are you looking towards eternity? If you're children of God, if you're wise, you want to think about in light of eternity, right? Isn't that what Jesus is talking about? The kingdom of heaven is like this. Are you thinking like this? But those people had, had no power. They were just still under the law. You know, a lot of times we just think from text to text, from minute to minute. The next question is, how am I building my house? Okay, look, look at the next, look at the next one, the next picture. See, aren't those beautiful houses? See, and that's a picture of your life. That's a picture of your life. Beautiful, isn't it? You don't know what's inside. All you can really see is the difference. There's no description of the house, but the house represents your life. They look sturdy. They look strong on the outside. They might even be doing good activities. They might even be going in all those houses, going to church. They might be raising a family, all good stuff. But is it the house that matters? Not according to this. It's not the house that matters. See, and I'm, I'm going to now shift. I'm assuming everybody's born again here. Okay? And Jesus Christ did it. But as a born again believer, you need to make a decision. Are you going to stand on the rock? Are you going to build up on the foundation? See, that's what holds up the house. Your life is the foundation. Okay, now the other thing, go to the next slide if you can. Now he talks about storms. Now let me ask you this. Have you had storms in your life? Do we have storms? I heard one guy say, well, you're either coming out of a storm, in a storm, or going into one. Storms are a part of life. St 
storms are sent on the just and the unjust. Isn't that what it said in earlier in the sermon? It, he reigns on the just and the unjust. The storms of life come regardless. It hits all those houses. It doesn't just hit the ones. And sometimes I think we think we can build the perfect life. And if I build my perfect life and I do everything the right way, there won't be storms. That's not what I'm reading here. I'm not reading that. We can do everything perfectly, but storms are coming. Why does God use storms? Why does God use storms? I don't know about you. Now, I grew up on the West Coast, so I really didn't get, a, get to see a lot of thunderstorms out there. But I tell you, when we didn't have them much. We had lightning storms. So thunderstorms like you see like there, I wasn't used to. When I came here, it scared me to death. And when we started having kids, when they would wake up, what would they do? Daddy, I'm scared. They're going to run to Daddy. Because they want to be comforted. Too bad their dad was scared to death. Thunderstorms scare me. But in life, and in this, where do you run when there's a storm? Do you run to daddy? Or is it, I'll figure it out. He wants you to run to him. So, and the purpose of storms are to reveal what you are building on. Did you get that? What do you rely on when things go crazy? Storms are going to expose it. When you get in trouble, where do you run? You know, let's face it. For some people, it's alcohol. Some people, it's relationships. Good and bad. Some people run to jobs. Well, if I just work harder, spend more time there, I'll get promoted. So when storms come, they run to that. Some people run to power. I just need a little bit more power. So this is where we need to learn that when we try to live life in our own resources, and can I say this? Even if we're a Christian, did you know you can live life out of your own resources as a Christian? Have you ever run to your job for satisfaction? Have you ever run to, well, if I just get this much money, then I'll be okay. Well, if I run to this person, oh, this person's going to satisfy everything. And if I run to this person, now none but Christ can satisfy. No other name but thee. There's no other one that can truly satisfy you but Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. None. Now, you might run to other things. You might run to your own resources. God wants you as a Christian. And this is what we learned last week during the seminar, is not live as a Christian out of the self-life. Did you know that as a Christian you can live as a selfer? Did you know that? So even though Christ saved us, we have a sinful nature that's still there. As a born-again believer, you have a battle going on between the spirit and the flesh. Add 
to it. You've got temptation that Satan likes to throw in. Add to it the world system. You can rely on those things as a Christian. The question is, are you living out of your new identity? What's your new identity as a born-again believer? What is it? Christ. That's why when you see Paul write, if anyone is in Christ, he is, present tense, a new creation. All things passed away, all things are new. But see, the condition is, are you in Christ? And I don't know about you, that's, what, that's why I call walking with the Lord. Now that used to be big when I first got saved. Are you walking with the Lord? I don't know, did you guys ever hear that? When you, and the idea is, are you walking with the Lord? Every step that you take, are you in the Lord? Every thought that you have, are you in the Lord? Or are you going to your identity that Christ saved you from? <laughs> Yourself. And where you get it. So those questions we want to answer today. Oh my goodness, it's 12 o'clock already. <laughs> Ah. Well, you know what? It's going to be pretty self-explanatory. So let's do this. We're just going to read it. And we'll see. What's the key is your foundation. Okay, go to the next slide if you can, Sonny. Go next one. Next one. So this is the fool. Now, as a, as a Christian, can you be a fool? I've been a fool. Now, there is that thing of being a fool for Christ's sake, which is a good thing. You know, you share the gospel. We're out there. We look like fools on Friday. We're going out there. And we just look like idiots, you know? We're fools for Christ. Okay, but we can live life foolishly. And to cut to the chase, when we live life foolishly, and we see that our life is built on, what is that underneath that house? Sand. That's a problem. And what is sand? That is every self, the world. It's, it's you doing thing, things in your own power. That's the end. Okay. Now, compare that to, go to the next one. See, oh, here we go. Now, there's the foundation. Now, you know, but well, you didn't know, I didn't know, I had to research rock, building a structure, a house, that you have to, the most secure place to do it is where what's called bedrock. If you can get down to the bedrock, and I had to go to a website, a construction uh, website, and I looked it up. Why should you uh, build on bedrock? Here's what came up. Stability. Resistance to shifting. Okay? Weight bearing. It's very dense. So does nothing so it does not deform or fail. Okay? It doesn't get bent out of shape. It's earthquake resistant. So when the storms come, that house will stand. It's a, it's a load-bearing stretch. It's perfect, they say. Now, this is according to a construction. For stabilizing structures. Have you ever felt unstable in life? Yeah. Amen. <clears throat> but see, he is stable in all his ways. Yeah. See? So the last thing that it said, though, was, why won't you build your house on bedrock then? 
Why wouldn't every builder do it? And you know what the answer was? What do you think the answer was? Bingo! It costs too much. It costs too much. As soon as I heard that, I'm like, okay, well, that makes sense. That kind of reminds me of something. If any disciple wants to come after me, deny himself. Let him take up his cross. Now, I didn't die that death, but I do have to bear my cross every day. And my cross is not your cross. And your cross is not my cross. My cross is everything that wants to get me off of the foundation of Jesus Christ. Isn't that wonderful? But it's going to cost. You know what it costs? Where is your identity? Is it self? Is it the way you look at it? Is it the way you see things? Is it good things? It's not, it doesn't have it to be sinful. I'm talking to Christians now. What's your identity? Are you looking out at the world with your eyes, the way you see things, or do you see it with the eyes of Christ? Because did you know that when you receive Christ, you have a new identity? Did you know that? You have a new identity. So as opposed to live out of your old identity, how you view people, how you view situations, you now look at it the way Christ sees it. You have a new identity. Isn't that cool? That's what Paul deals with in all his letters to the church at so-and-so. Let's look at one. It's my favorite. It's, it's one of my life's verses. Galatians 2. If you can pull that up, and I want to make sure I quote it accurately. Galatians 2. 20. And we're going to read 21 also. See, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. See, the problem is when we look at things the way we see it, we're still alive. Do you see that? But if we've been crucified, a transaction takes place. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. I I'm not alive anymore. Did you, can you see that? <laughs> I'm dead in Christ. And that's what baptism represents. I died with him, and he raised me up in newness of life. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Ah, there we go. Christ lives in me. He's at the center of my life. Praise God. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of, by faith in the Son of God, who what? Loved me and gave himself for me. Now, the next verse, I, I, I said this is one of my favorite verses for so long. The next verse, I, haven't, I didn't even notice till last week. I do not set aside the grace of God. How did you come to faith? By what? Grace. I don't want to set aside grace. I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, which when Jesus is talking to those people, they're viewing everything through the law. I've got to do this. I've got to do this. And they just must be sitting there and saying, man, my righteousness must have to exceed that of the Pharisees. How is that going to happen? But see, what's impossible with man is possible with God. It's the gift of God. It's the free gift of God that was given on Calvary. He not only saved you when you were there, but he sanctified, as John mentioned this word, he sanctified you in Christ. And guess what? 
he also glorified you in Christ. If any man be in Christ. Praise God. So we want to build on a strong foundation. You know what that foundation is? What is it? The rock. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 10. We're going to start in verse 9. And boy, was Corinth messed up. 1 Corinthians 3, 9. For we are God's fellow workers... You are God's field. You are God's what? Building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me, Paul, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. And another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. So that's... That's your warning. How are you building? Are you a wise builder or are you a foolish builder? Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work. Oh, wait, I can't miss that. Verse 11, for no other foundation can anyone lay that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Okay, sorry about that. I can't miss that one. Now, verse 12, now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it. That's the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema seat where we will be evaluated. Did we build our house on the rock? Or did we build our house on the sand? Okay? It's not a determination of heaven or hell, the being the seed of Christ. Okay? If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. Praise God. Praise God for that. So... Let's go back to it. Is there one more slide up there? Yeah, application. Application. There we go. So, what do we do about it? It's 1213. You got to see that storms reveal who you are. You know? And what you're building on. And it exposes a trial's will. When things don't go right. But are you going to trust the Lord who saved you, or are you going to trust your own resources? Okay. As a child of God, what prevents us from applying his word? I said a lot of this. So you look through it. Career power, money, family power, looks. <sighs> Trying to live the Christian life in our own resources. Living out my life in my old identity. How about this? Wrong attitudes. Stubbornness, like God doesn't love me. <laughs> if you're a bought Christian, blood-bought Christian, you should know God loves you. You should know God loves you. If you don't, you need to go back to Jesus Christ because he loves you. He demonstrated his love. Stubbornness and pride, not abiding in Christ, that's... If there's one thing I can say, if you're, if you have to abide, you know what that word abide means? It, it comes from the, the word abode. It means to make your house under. So are you dwelling under Christ as a Christian? Do you sense his protection for you in the storms of life? Do you run to him? Do you cry out, Abba, Father? Help! I need you. My identity is in you because you gave me a new identity in Christ. Amen. I'm going to read one more verse because we need to be careful as Christians how we do things. And Paul gives us 
a clue because now we are in the church age, right? Personally, I don't think for very much longer. We are in the church age. And when he calls his church home, the rules change. Rules change. But look at it. So Paul in Ephesians 1, 2, and 3 lays out his theology of the new man, the church. Then he says, okay, now let's make it practical. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Now, how do we do that as the church? We got, we got to get strong. We got to get our guns out. We got to come a blazing. Here's how God says he builds his church. With all lowliness and gentleness. With long suffering, bearing with one another in love. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond. Now, I'm going to ask that question again. How's that working out for you? How's that working out for you? Apart from Jesus Christ, you can't do it. Because the same way with verse 2, I'm going to focus on. With all lowliness and gentleness. How did you come to Christ? Was it saying, yeah, I'm going to do it. Is that the way you came to Christ? How, how did you come? Humble and a contrite heart, he says, I will not despise. And when you see this with all lowliness and gentleness, God wants a humble spirit, a contrite heart when he builds his church. Why? Otherwise, we can go out to the world and we can find all the other, you know, uh, boxing matches that we, we can. When we build the church, we want to do it with all lowliness. And you know what lowliness means? You're humble and you exalt Jesus Christ. He is great. He is high. He is worthy. He is, he is, he is. But see, the problem becomes, and that's what makes us humble. Because we see he's the king. I'm nothing. He saved me. And so when we come for life to build the church, what should we do? We should do it with all lowliness. The same grace that saved you, that bought you, is the same grace that will sanctify you and perfect you. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Jesus Christ builds his church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Hallelujah. Let's close in prayer. Lord, we just thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for the saving grace of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for his example. How, though he was rich, though he was perfect, he humbled himself. He became lowly. That we, through his poverty, might be made rich. Thank you for the riches in this sermon, on the Sermon of the Mount. Thank you for these high standards. But Lord, may we see that it's only in Christ that we can do anything that's of eternal value. So, Lord, I just pray, Lord, you'd work in our heart. Lord, that Christ would be magnified. That we, Lord, would see in us dwells no good thing. It's by your grace, Lord. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for your love. Thank you for each one here. Thank you for saving them. And I pray, Lord, you continue to work in their lives. And, Lord, that they would continue to build their house on the rock of our salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.